This week, Conflict Zone is in Brussels as the EU prepares to mark 60 years of the Treaty of Rome. It faces unprecedented challenges ranging from Brexit to the diplomatic row with Turkey. Our guest is Margarete Vestaya, European Commissioner for Competition. Amidst growing disunity, is the European Union about to fall apart? Margaret Versailles, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank Turkey you very has much. accused Germany and the Netherlands of using Nazi methods. On Wednesday, European Commission President Jean Claude Juncker finally broke his silence, saying he was scandalized by the allegation, but Erdogan doesn't care, does he? Yes, I think he cares. Yes? Yes. But he continues every day but that, to but say I, that Europe is the product of Nazism, of uh, fascism. So what is changing? Because Juncker said something? No, but because there are different levels of communication. You see all this is completely unheard of, unacceptable. And yet, at the same time, you have relationships. Uh, there has to be a dialogue, there has, there to, has be, to be, or yes. there is? Well, sometimes it's somewhat quiet, I'd say. And today, uh, this time? Sometimes it's, it's much more robust, and sometimes it's constructive. But the important thing is, one, that you can say how you feel, that it is absolutely unacceptable, the rhetorics that we hear right now. But second, also, that you can keep talking. But Erdogan is not talking with the European Union, he is talking about the Europeans. Again, uh, European uh, Council President Donald Tusk said anybody who saw fascism in Rotterdam was detached from reality. But here again, Erdogan doesn't care what Mr. Tusk is saying. He is not speaking anymore with the European Union, he is even not speaking anymore with the leaders, he is speaking about them. Yes, but, but we also speak to s Turkish citizens. Because Turkey is, of course, so much more than uh, Mr. Erdogan, as well as anyone else is more than the government. And I think it's very important not to say, this is, this is a country, you have uh, a leader, he's everything that is to be said about this country. But he's very important. You are a politician, he's a politician, the European Union, um, the uh, prime ministers. I mean, is there a red line for the EU? Yes, obviously there are red lines because we all have that. But sometimes the biggest thing is to be able to do the two things, to say, well, this is not acceptable, and then finding ways not to lose the relationship, no matter how estranged it is. Where uh, is the red really. line? Well, it's not for, for me to... to uh, sure, you are a very important politician in the European Union. Where is the red line? I mean, what can happen more... Um, and you are saying still, we have to speak, no reaction. But the thing is that sometimes the most difficult thing is to be able not to say, that's the end, we will never talk again, this is the red I line. I didn't ask, we don't talk again, I asked you, were it the red line? But where you are saying, hey, that's it, we continue to talk, but you have to know, that's it. But that very much depends on what you're talking about. When it comes to the rhetorics, I think the European president and the European leaders has been extremely clear. The foreign minister of Turkey is speaking that it is very good possible that there will be a war of religion in Europe. And, and those voices you hear in Europe as well. Is it possible? Well, unfortunately, I think that as long as humans are responsible for peace, war is a risk. Is uh, Erdogan a danger for peace in Europe? Is he destabilizing well, I, Europe? I don't, I don't think it makes much sense to put that kind of marker on anyone. To say you are But you are not peace. so shy when it's about North Korea. You are not so shy when it's about Russia. You are telling the people, yes, there is a danger. This government is dangerous. Why so shy when uh, we are speaking about Erdogan? Why are you so shy? Well, mm -hmm. the problem, I mean, he's not shy. 
Yeah, but we have a very long-standing relationship, not only with Erdogan, but also with the Russian, with the, the Turkish population. We have, they have been going on for many, many years, uh, and they are at a standstill, it's kind of a pause uh, at the moment of accession talks. Numerous uh, people with a Turkish background live in Europe, has become citizen in, in member states. We have but very strong trade relations. this doesn't replace diplomacy, and we know that this doesn't replace diplomacy. I mean, can it be that the EU is basically afraid Turkey will kill the refugee de deal, and Turkey is speaking about the two parties signed last year? Is this a threat? Yep, yeah, but, but the thing is that you, you cannot let anyone take you hostage and say, well, this thing will not happen if you do something else. Uh, because part of what Europe is dealing with in these years, I think everyone, leaders, citizens, is to figure out how to, how to take upon us the responsibility. Turkey is doing the dirty job the EU doesn't want to do in the refugee crisis. And that's why Turkey is saying, you don't like us, we don't like you, so take your refugees, we don't do any more your work. Well, well that, was, that was a thing even before uh, all these things happened because it's a deal that is fragile. But at the same time, you have very direct and very robust criticism about things that takes place in Turkey. If you see the latest, where every year there is a report, how are things going? It's probably the most critical report the Commission has ever done about the situation in Turkey. So let's when talk it about consequences. freedom of speech, uh, yes. the journalist, uh, etc., etc. So let's uh, speak about consequences, because papers are papers, but reality is something else. The Turkish foreign minister says, quote, the EU statement is of no value to us. Isn't it time for Brussels to freeze the negotiations about Turkey's membership of the EU? Is this not the minimum to do? But that's, to freeze it. But that is for a member state to decide. So what's your opinion about that? But on that I have taken no opinion, because it is not for me to take that decision. What is your opinion about? Do you believe that a country, violation of human rights, journalists in jails, members of the opposition in jail, uh, I mean, why can't the EU interrupt officially the negotiations with Turkey and say, as long this is going on, we don't have a foundation for any negotiation of cooperation with the EU and Turkey. But we can. But we have to take that decision, as we do in Europe, in an orderly manner. What and is I your opinion? Do you think that the moment is now given? That we have to... It's, I mean, it's not only um, a symbol towards Turkey, it's also a question of our belief in our own values. But th this is not a new thing, this question. No, but I'm talking we, about today. Yes, but, but you cannot talk today and forget what happened a week ago or two weeks ago or two months ago. But the EU is not cancelling these negotiations. Why not? Because that decision has not been taken yet. And because EU is a place where you first listen and discuss and then you take a decision. And for a very long time, it has been obvious. I'm asking you a last time, your opinion about that. Yes, You're an important person representing Europe. You are coming from a country where European values are a very uh, respected foundation. What but, is your opinion? But Do you I, believe that Europe has to cancel these negotiations, yes or no? But I will be more than happy to answer your question, if you will hear me out. Because the reason that we are having this discussion is for a very long time this negotiation has not been moving forward. Because if you are ever to become a member of the European Union, you have to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria. You have to be a democratic country. Would you with negotiate with Putin and Russia? Freedoms? Would you negotiate with Putin and Pas uh, Russia? No. Because you will say this is a dictatorship. Why are you not breaking down these negotiations and telling Erdogan, you will restart a little bit more democracy, we will continue our negotiation. Yes, but one of the things in a democracy is that you do respect the way that you take decisions. I told you my opinion is that it is very far away from Turkey being able to finalize everything, but it is for Europeans to take the decision to put a halt to negotiations, because this is the way we work. 
Turkey, to a certain degree, seems to have temporarily solved the Netherlands' problem with populism. Prime Minister Mark Rutte beat Gerd Wilders in Wednesday's elections partly on the back of his tough strands against Turkey. Do you believe that uh, populism failed? That Wilders failed? That the right-wing movements failed? Well, he, he had not the, the election he was expected to have, but he still had a good election. He won 30%? Yes. And who to lost? And therefore, I don't think you can say that the Dutch election is something final. And anyway, we're all changing because the political agenda has moved on. There's no going back to a time before you had much more sort of national voices in the European political debate. So there is a lot of work to do and it will change not only those who vote for populist or nationalist parties today, it will also change those of us who really strongly believe in European cooperation. So it's a myth that uh, people are saying um, the elections in Netherlands uh, are proof that right-wing populist parties uh, will not have a future in the next months, for example, in France. Are you concerned, still concerned, that Marine Le Pen could be president in France? Well, I just have a different point of view. I think the Dutch election was, a, was very good. It was a, an important, positive step. But it's it is build a 30 percent more votes. But it is definitely not the end of the discussion about what we want to do with Europe and who is going to lead it and in what direction. On the contrary, that discussion continues. It will continue in, in France, it will continue in Germany, it continues in Denmark. It doesn't go away with one election because some of the questions that people are asking are completely legitimate. Where are we going? How are we as citizens going to make the most out of, of the state of the world instead of goods being sort of reserved for, for fewer and fewer people? That are completely legitimate questions. And they one, do not go away. one of the legitimate questions is, what is Europe today? Let's take another example. Donald Tusk has just been elected, re-elected president of the European Council. 27 of the EU's 28 vo uh, members voted for him. The only one that didn't was Poland, his own country. But what is the answer from Poland? They feel insulted and they promised not to cooperate anymore. How do you respond to that? I mean, it's a democratic decision. Yes. And, and obviously, people appreciate Donald Tusk and the way that he's working. And, They're and speaking how about the reaction of his, Poland. His leadership. It was a democratic reaction. And their answer is that Poland even threatened to take revenge against the EU by blocking summit decisions. This is the tone of enemies, not of allies. Yes. But this is why the situation in Europe is not solved in one go. This is why the, the Commission is inviting people to engage in a debate about what we want to do in order to change this from being a, a rhetoric of confrontation and finding out, well, how can these confrontation be sort of directed into something constructive? But let, let's continue with your idea of constructive. Poland does not respect the rule of law. And Poland is also not respecting the EU and the Commission. Nobody is really respecting the decisions of the EU, even not a country which is a member of the EU. But I think it is jumping to conclusions to say that because we have very serious issues with Poland, no one respects uh, Hungary the doesn't respect, taken. Poland doesn't respect. But that is true. And the others are really respecting? We are, resp are the other countries respecting, for example, with the euro questions um, or the necessities not to spend more money than it is allowed? Every country, soon or less, is breaking rules. Even no. Germany, even France. But I, I completely disagree. This is not the Europe I see. I see a Europe who is still struggling to, to deal with maybe the most the deepest crisis in, in modern history of, uh, of our community. And yet, with all that we have overcome, you see people finding ways. You have growth in every country. You have jobs being created, unemployment going down. Step speak with Italy, step, speak with it Spain, speak with Portugal. The unemployment of the young generation is over 20%, 30%. This is a success story of Europe? 
No, but it is in the right direction because it was much, much deeper. And these countries has, has been doing a lot of things to reform their economies, to, to enable their banks to move on, to support the rest of the economy. Uh, these are reforms that has been very deep. And that's, and why, Great Britain is leaving, and that's why Great Britain is leaving uh, the EU, the first country, a very so? important one. If it would be a success story, why Great Britain would leave um, uh, uh, the EU? The crisis just keep piling up. The rhetoric, everything is better, everything will be good. Here is the result. Great Britain wants to leave the EU. This is the beginning of the end of the story. The European Union is a success story. I completely disagree. That Great Britain wants to leave or that the EU is not a no, success story? No, because that you, you, you use the fact of Brexit to jump into a, a void... Uh, a story about something that is completely falling apart. Completely? I mean, Great Britain, one of the most important Western countries, a NATO partner, decides to leave the EU in the 60th years of anniversary of the contract of Rome. And you are saying that it is exaggerated that the EU is in a crisis? No, I'm saying that I disagree with your views, because I do. Because what I see that we have achieved here gives us, I think, the confidence that we can solve also crises as deep as this. Because the thing is that we have, have the crisis, and they are many, and most of them we haven't chosen ourselves. What we can choose is to take the responsibility to do something about it. And that responsibility and the strength to do that comes from amazing things. This is the longest period of peace in, well, almost world history. Uh, because Europe has never been this peaceful before. It was doable. But things are changing. Are you aware that things are changing? But what is not changing is the fact that there are humans, citizens, who want something else. And it is still, for, for all the crises that you're piling up, Europe is still one of the best places to live on Earth in history, especially if you're a woman. And that willingness to do something about it, that should not be hampered by piling up crisis, that should be an inv invitation to engage and do something about it. And you find politicians in every country, you find citizens in every country who want to do something else. Then just lean back and say, oh my God, everything is falling apart, I will do nothing but protect myself. So speak, let us speak, um, and let's continue to speak about egoism of this beautiful European Union and their members. Uh, speaking of tax havens, for example, something which is still uh, a competition tool in the European Union of disharmony. Um, you say, for example, let's take a concrete example where you are working mm -hmm. for. Uh, Apple owes Ireland uh, 13 billion in taxes and have ordered Dublin to recover the money. Dublin doesn't want the money, it wants the employment. That's reasonable. Yes, but there is nothing to suggest that they can't have both. Ireland is a very attractive place to do business. They have the lowest corporate tax in Europe. But it becomes illegal state aid if you allow companies, specific companies, to have a selective advantage. And not even pay the 12.5%, but pay less than 1%. Still, they say they don't agree with you. We are Ireland. We decide what is good for our people? Yes, and some of those decisions, they have been taken in the European part of our democracy, where we have decided... What will happen? What are you doing? Ireland don't want, doesn't want to cooperate. Well, they do. They are in the process of... Uh, our of processes in Europe are years and years. Well, I don't see it like this, because they have to figure out how to, how to recover 13 billion. What kind of ESCO account can you put that kind of money in? It's not 24 uh, million like in, in the Starbucks case, or 700 million like in, in the Belgian cases. Uh, this is a lot of money, and we are working with the Iris in order for them to do the recovery. So let's, let's take another example about your authority. You allowed Facebook to merge with WhatsApp. Facebook promised not to use consumer data from WhatsApp, but it broke 
its promise. Uh, now you are pressing uh, charges against Facebook for allegedly misleading regulators. But you allowed the merger and now you regret it, right? No. They are doing what no. they want. You don't regret? No, because these are two separate things. Because the fact that they gave, in our opinion, misleading information was not the decisive thing in allowing them to merge. You can be allowed to merge, but you have to tell so us the what full will story. Happen? What will happen? Well, of course, Facebook will defend themselves against our accusations. And then, eventually, if we find that they do not have sufficient proof that they were doing the right thing, then we will take a decision. What will be the decision? I mean, you have two decisions, two options. What's your priority now? Preserving the merger or protecting citizens? When they say, we continue to do what we are just doing, what will you do to protect are the Europeans uh, against such a decision. But uh, what will you do? Will you sue them? Well, since this decision was not the decisive decision in, in the merger, this is not about unraveling the merger. This is about making sure that we get the right decision, that people doesn't mislead us, that they don't but tamper they with did. the evidence. I mean, Facebook did it. The WhatsApp tools are now included. You promised this will not happen. No, Facebook promised that it would not But you deal happen. with them, so both of you promised. No, it, just, it doesn't work this way. I'm, I'm very sorry, but these are not the categories so how do you protect us? that you have to choose against. How do you protect us that this will not be continuously? Because if Facebook do not have sufficient evidence to say we didn't do what you're curious about, then there will be a decision and in that decision there will be a consequence. But it will not be unraveling the murder because this decision that we're dealing with... What, what options are there? Well, the most obvious options in our set of rules, they are fines. If you do not give us the right information, you will have a fine. Um, let's take a look um, at LuxLeaks. The leaking of confidential information about Lux Luxembourg's tax policies toward multinational companies. Bloomberg News in an editorial said European Commission President and former Prime Minister of Luxembourg Jean-Claude Juncker, quote, made his country rich by picking the pockets of other countries, including those of the European Union he is now mandated to serve. He should have resigned, shouldn't he? What a scandal. Well, what he did was to say to me that I had completely free hands to do what I thought was the right thing to do in the follow-up of LuxLeaks and this is what we're doing. The British MP Margaret Hodge called him, called it the height of hypocrisy that Mr. Junk Juncker represents still the EU. He has zero public credibility on this point. How can any voter take his pledges seriously to clamp down on tax evasion? What's about credibility? Well, that you have to find in the actions, in the decisions that we actually do take, in the cases that we open. The four cases already on Starbucks, Fiat, the Belgian scheme, the we Apple case. We're speaking about Mr. Juncker's involvement. We're speaking about a country like Luxembourg. We are speaking about tax evasion. Luxembourg was the center of all the things, and Mr. Juncker was leading in this country. No consequences. Today, he is representing the good side. But this is not about saying. This is not about debate. This is about doing. We're doing something about he it. He is doing with you. Is but, he credible? But, but that is not the point. It is. Because the credibility of the commission in doing the job is doing the job. He is and this is what we're doing. I, I'm very sorry. He is representing uh, the commission. And he is one of the problems and not one of the solution, isn't it? But the thing is that for citizens to see that things change, they have to see that things change. It's not a problem about who said what at what time. But he did. It is actually he did. action. He actioned. It was not what he said. He was prime minister. I'm very sorry. I, uh, I mean, no, you have, you, but you have to admit, <laughs> nothing is good. No, everything is good. You think everything is good? No, but, but the, I, cannot, I cannot deal in your categories because I have a job to do. But he is the president of the commission. You are part of the yes, commission. But no, no criticism? But, but no matter. No if, matter? If, if one took your line of reasoning, 
that wouldn't that wouldn't bring one euro back to taxpayers. But what does it mean? It means you did you failed a few years ago. You have today an important post, and what happened yesterday is not any more important for today. I mean, you are politicians. You are representing um, a lot of uh, activities. But if you are not representing what you are saying because you did the opposite, how can people trust in Europe? Because there's a job that's being done. Because those who didn't pay their taxes now do. Because member states change their le legislation in order for this not to happen again. Margaret Vestia, thank you very much for being in conference. It was a pleasure. <laughs>